I mean, I had to look up what a reed was. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's just something you never, you don't just learn it. <laughs> so what did you find, Josh? <laughs> it was a piece of grass. <laughs> guys welcome back we are at episode 11 and continuing in luke we're glad to have pastor randall back I'm glad that Woo-hoo. his hand is doing better i even saw Look him pound <laughs> i even saw him pound the podium so to speak a couple yeah, times i yeah. was like well it must not be hurting that much yeah, blood pus squirting out each hit <laughs> <laughs> don't want to sit on the front row anymore <laughs> we are jumping into chapter seven this week And so it starts off, uh, as Luke has it, with the healing of the centurion slave. And there's some interesting things within this because a lot of times people are amazed at Jesus and what he says and, you know, all that type of stuff. But this is actually a time where Jesus is amazed at somebody else. Well, he he understood the depth of Jesus's power beyond what other people. Everybody else is amazed that he's doing these things. The centurion is like, no, you ain't got to come here. It's just, I know how powerful you are. You can just say it. It It was unique compared to other interactions, his, yeah. his understanding, or at least belief, for lack of better words, of what Jesus was capable of doing. When I think about it, I think about his the way that the centurion understood authority. He related it, you know, Jesus's authority over sickness to his authority over these, you know, soldiers. Right. And, um, you know, he's like, well, if I tell them to do this, they're going to do it. So obviously you can do this, you know, because you have the authority. And I was just thinking about, you know, what kind of faith is this? And it's the faith that, you know, trusts in who Jesus is. And Mm so, you know, before, um, you know, looking at the miracles, maybe they did understand who Jesus was, but they knew that his ability to heal (laughs) was, was something that they wanted. Well, I wondered whether it was kind of playing off of not necessarily that they're directly related, but at the same time, you know, when when Jesus has spoken of that the humility and faith, the poor in spirit, that maybe this particular person was a little bit because he's like, listen, I'm not worthy of you coming under my roof. And so it wasn't even just the authority of Jesus, but he's seeing that there's something within that, that now there's humility in that because he's saying, you don't need to come. I'm not worthy Mm. of you coming, but just say the word and this is going to happen. Mm. Um, and the fact that I think that there's probably something special that he sent Jewish elders. Like I was trying to take mm. note of that to say, well, he's probably sending people that he's probably thinking maybe Jesus will listen to better right. <laughs> as opposed to some Roman centurion coming at him. Right. Um, but at the same time, he might maybe had the right, you know, over Jesus in terms of if he was a Ro- Roman centurion, then he could have probably approached Jesus. But it was that humility that he was coming with. So I thought maybe that was part of it as well. Yeah, I think that's but, rich. No, not just understanding who Jesus was, but understanding who he is. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Moving on into the raising of the widow's son. So we've got a couple crowds that are kind of converging. That's one of the first things that there's a big crowd that's kind of coming with Jesus. And there's also a big crowd coming out, wailing, weeping, all that type of stuff uh, because this child had died. This is an interesting one because it said they were struck with fear. Yes. I was going to go to the same place. <laughs> verse 16. Like fear seized them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, I like that. And yeah, I think any uh, any one of us would probably react the same way if we knew someone was dead, went through their whole funeral process, and you know, is carrying them out, and then they get up, <laughs> start talking. You're, hey, right. Where we're going, yeah. guys? Uh, <laughs> 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 Not only that, but the fact that they um, respond to, surely this is a great prophet. I'm like, wait, so you just saw him raise somebody from the yeah. dead. And your response is, this is a great prophet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he has a standing that's a little bit above just a great prophet. Moving on into John the Baptist. We've talked about this before, but at yeah. the same time, I still want to know because we talked, Josh and I, Josh mentioned it last week. In John's account, then John the Baptist, you know, he says literally, look, here's the Lamb of right. God right. who takes away the right. sin of the world and stuff. And he says it more than once within that first chapter. Mm-hmm. And and yet, even yeah. again, in that first chapter, he's also saying, at first, I didn't really understand it. Why do you think John really was questioning Jesus at this point? Why did he send people? Do you have any other insights after, you know, going through it again, I guess? <laughs> I, would, I would maintain that circumstances can can make you stumble. Yeah. Uh, and in so many different ways, you know, when you face a lot of things that were just unexpected, um, then it can it can make you question you know, all sorts of stuff. The depth of your soul really can, it can, you can come up with questions that you never had before. And, uh, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think sometimes that's a process that you go through whenever mm-hmm. you, you face tragedy and, and uh, you come back to, you know, the center of, yes, God is worthy. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God is God. 
And uh, so I think there's a there's a process that we go through whenever we we meet a lot of these tragedies in, in life. And you know, being placed in prison certainly was not something he was expecting, probably. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting still, you know, every time I read it, that instead of Jesus being like, yeah, I am who you think I am, because he says that to the disciples, he just answers with the things that are happening. And so he's referring to the signs and, you know, expecting John to, to hear these things and know, okay, yeah, this is, this really is who I thought. <laughs> yeah. And so I wonder if some of the, the declarations that he had, because John won, you know, when we get there and stuff and we're going to see this is, this is happening, you know, at the outset. And so maybe he made those declarations, but at this point he's still unsure. And so it wasn't mm-hmm. necessarily like he, you know, had that direct revelation from God in right. the sense, but he's, sta- he's making a statement of belief. But then at this point he's, he's backing up and he's like, well, maybe I had it wrong. But I mean, when you read John, it's, it's pretty, you know, you would think that John the Baptist is very clear on that. He believes that, yes, this is the son of God. This is the Messiah. This is the lamb that's going to take away the sin mm. of the world. Well, yeah. and I think too, there's, there's, I mean, it's so telling of the human condition. We often want to come back to that assurance again. It's yeah. not that it's uh, not that we necessarily doubt it altogether, but at the same time, it's nice sometimes to be reconfirmed and that, yes, this is, you're on the right path. Okay. I thought I was just want to make sure. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just checking in, just, just pinging off this. It's a, uh, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm better now, you know, it's yeah. one of those things. <laughs> Do you guys think that there's anything within like this reed shaking in the wind? Like when Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, he's like, well, who did you go out to see? Just a reed shaking in the wind and somebody nice clothing, soft clothing. Uh, we understand that that's the answer to those questions is no, they right. didn't just go out to see a reed shaking. They didn't go out to just see somebody in soft clothing because John didn't, you know, fit that bill. Uh, so what is, is there any meaning behind that? Or what is the meaning if people are curious? I mean, I had to look up what a reed was. <laughs> can, I didn't... can we cut that? <laughs> <laughs> He's because, never played the clarinet. No, like when I thought of it, I was oh, like, no. oh, like a clarinet. <laughs> yeah, knock that thing over. Yeah, yeah here it is. This is, this is a reed. This is a reed. Yeah. <laughs> I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's just something you never, you don't just learn it. <laughs> so what did you find, Josh? <laughs> It was a piece of grass. <laughs> but when I read it first, because of my musical mind, I was like, oh, man, this is like okay. a clarinet. <laughs> okay. All right. I can see where you went with that. Which is also... A reed, yes. You could... You blow yep. across a reed to make noise, yeah. Yep. And you could do that with the same piece of grass. Yes, you this could. is true. Anyway, I mean, basically, what I what I understood from it is like, yeah, you don't go out there just to watch grass blow in the wind. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I saw some commentator that said it was the equivalent to the modern day watching paint dry. Yeah. yeah. Right. I also saw someone say that they related this to be like, you know, John the Baptist wasn't someone who was easily swayed by public opinion, which yeah. I think was an interesting. Yeah. The doctrine. You know, John the Baptist wasn't someone who would just give you what you want to hear. He was. For know, sure that. Truth. Verse 29. Now, all the people who heard this, even the tax collectors, acknowledged God's justice because they had been baptized with John's baptism. However, the Pharisees and the experts in the religious law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. So question for you guys in terms of what does God's justice, uh, how did they, how is that related? Like in the baptism that John offered and God's justice, how are those brought together together? I would have to do some word search on the word acknowledged there, but um, if we substituted it for submitted, I bet it would fit. I just mm-hmm. uh, I would like to look at the Greek word and see what else it could be. But uh, the idea I, I take from this is their submission to God's way mm-hmm. is is what is what we're getting at. Whereas the, the Pharisees would not submit to it. Would they have known that this was the way, oh, but then gotcha. rejected it, or whether it was more a matter that their eyes were closed? And so, you know, it says that they rejected God's purpose for themselves. Yeah. And so in my mind, I feel like there, there is something there in terms of they knew, but they rebelled against it. It seems most of the New Testament would agree with that thought that uh, there was a more of a rejection than um, them yeah. not knowing it. Yeah. I like verse 31 and 32. I've always have. I just, you know, I feel like, you know, sometimes I'll tell that to people. You know what you're like. <laughs> <laughs> you're like the children in the market. To give you something good and you're not happy. I give you something bad, you're not sad. You just refuse to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, and it, uh, as much as we like to tell it to others, it's really about us, right? It's, uh, you know, we just cannot be satisfied in life is basically the, the gist of that. It seems like mm-hmm. just no matter how much 
is going good. It seems like we want more, and it's uh, there's, there's so many different applications of that particular passage. We understand it for the Pharisees particularly that uh, you know John came this way and they weren't happy, and Jesus came that way and they weren't happy, and like they just ultimately they're just not going to be happy because they're not going to ever submit no matter what. So that was the the gist of what he's saying. What about the anointing? I want to make sure that we don't skip over that very last portion of this passage in chapter 7. He said, woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And and her actions, it says in verse 48, that Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. What was it about her actions or, or maybe what was behind the actions that, that allowed so that she had faith that would save and that would give her peace, especially peace with God? I mean, I, I look at it and I see, well, one, she understands Jesus' worth. Um, and so, you know, the fact that she's going to use the most expensive oil she has, one, you know, that's ascribes worth Two, her mourn over her sinful state. Like she understands that she she needs some kind of intervention and she believes that Jesus can do that for her. And so when I look at at those two things, I, I see, OK, this is the this is the faith that Jesus is talking about. Um, and then it goes into the love where, you know, Jesus kind of tells this parable, like, who's going to love me more? One that has, you know, a big debt forgiven or a small debt forgiven. And, you know, Simon the Pharisee even answers. He was like, obviously the one with the big debt. And so Jesus is comparing her, her debt (laughs) is the large one, obviously, in this situation. And so he's saying she has loved me this much. um, And then therefore, her faith has has saved her. So understanding worth and yeah, and apparently he didn't see his debt as even yeah. being there to begin with. <laughs> right. Like so piddly that he didn't give Jesus, offer Jesus anything. Like right. he didn't see, yeah, he brought him into his house to have dinner, but you you kind of get the impression that maybe it wasn't, you know, from the standpoint of he's humbling himself, it seems more of a standpoint of, okay, let me check this guy out perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you want to play what is with the passage at, uh, as far as the harmonizing of them, mm-hmm. I do believe that Matthew, Mark, and John are the same story. Luke potentially is a different story altogether mm-hmm. and, uh, that, you know, on the table. But if it's not, if they are all the same story and there are ways to harmonize that as well, mm-hmm. then this same guy was also healed from the leprosy. Leper. Mm-hmm. And, uh, right. and so it would have been that much more impactful for Jesus to say, Hey, look, you know, she understands how much she's been given. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you not so much. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas you should have totally been like this as well, because you've also, and that's the reality, right? The reality is we've all been forgiven that much. Yeah. Even though he talks about her debt, big or little, all of us had an equally large right. debt and <clears> it's <throat> all been forgiven. So we should all equally love. It's just a matter of perception of what our debt was. Mm-hmm. I think it's funny, too, just the way that Jesus answers. He's like, Simon, I have something to say to you. (laughs) I wonder what type of tone that was. I feel like this is a a good example, too, of just Jesus has, I mean, I mean, I read it as compassion on the Pharisees still. I mean, he wants them to get it Mm -hmm. and they just will not. He could have just said, no, you're not going to get anything from me. And he knows that. (laughs) But instead, he still went. Yeah. So moving into chapter eight, Jesus is is moving, and as we're going to find in chapter nine, he's he's going to start to get on the road towards Jerusalem. He's going to set his mind. So we'll mention that a little bit later. But right now, it's mentioning a bunch of different ladies, um, women. Some are named, some are not. And uh, one thing to to be interesting, you know, that Herod's household manager was among them. So listen carefully in verse eighteen. For whoever has more will be given, or they will give be given more. But whoever does not have even what he thinks he has will be taken from him. What is that talking about? I, I mean, I feel like it's the revelation of the kingdom of God. So if you understand it, I mean, this is coming right off the parable of the sower. So mm-hmm. if you've grasped hold, um, then you're going to be given more. But if you do not grasp hold, then even what you think you have is not even, it doesn't amount to anything. Yeah. I'll go ahead and further on that one. The idea of the, you know, the for lack of better words, the pyramid scheme of, uh, <laughs> scheme's not a good, a pyramid <laughs> perspective of salvation and planting mm-hmm. the seeds, right? It's just because it's never just one thing. There's all sorts of ripple effect within that. And so the, the passage really does do a lot with in just that one statement of revealing, hey, you planted this seed and it's like, okay, you know, there was a little bit of effect, but what you couldn't see was what's going to happen after that. Mm-hmm. You know, one person gives their life to Christ and then, you know, their children after them and their grandchildren after them. And it turns into an entire generations of people that have now come to Christ because of one seed planted. And so it uh, comes back to the idea, hey, yeah, those who, who have, yeah, you planted and, and you harvested and it's like, but it was, it was way more than you think. You're getting, you're going to get way more than what you ever put in. It's uh, because there is just that compounding effect 
mm-hmm. of, you know, scripture calls it the leaven, right? And yeah. bread type idea. So, and, and of course, you know, back to what Josh said, those who are just under perception that they have something that they really don't, then obviously their end is going to be so much worse. They're just, yeah, and then there's two ways to look at that too. Yeah, we'll just, we probably better move on. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can keep scratching the thing. It's not to sit here and think about it. I don't know what you can say, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so, you know, let's say that the person who thoughts they have and they ends up to be taken from them, is that a picture of uh, somebody being lost for eternity? Is that a picture of somebody that has not sowed into the kingdom and so there's no rewards in heaven? And mm-hmm. so how do you how do you interpret that? It's way more time we want to spend on that one verse, but here we are. Well, I think, I mean, my first thought is, so for those who the light has been revealed, and those things that will be brought to light, then, yeah, I mean, it's more a matter of if you've if you've been exposed to the light, so to speak, in whatever form or whatever extent that is. So if we're seeing light and, you know, if you're up close, then you're seeing better. If you're further away, then the light's not acting as, as I guess, impactfully. Then the people on the outskirts or people that have kind of tasted and seen or people that have uh, seen a little bit, then if they're not responding, then yeah, perhaps they're, even that is going to be taken away. In the same way that with the parable of the sower, the people that have heard that the devil is going to steal away or mm-hmm. thorns are going to grow mm-hmm. up and that's going to take care of it or what have you. And so it's kind of like I do see them paired together in terms of, yes, it is possible for somebody to hear or be exposed to either the gospel or the church or something, the, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God, something like that, but it's not... I don't see it in terms of salvation necessarily. I see it as, you know, here's here's something that's being held out, but then it's kind of snatched away for whatever reason. And I'd agree. We probably won't hesitate taking our salvific theology from that particular passage yeah. right there. Yeah. But <laughs> it is, uh, you know, something to think there. Within the stilling of the storm, one day Jesus got into a boat and uh, his disciples went with him. Jesus takes a nap because he's tired. I can only imagine. And then the storm comes. And one of the things that I thought was interesting, and I've seen it before, but as far as Jesus rebuking the wind and the raging seas, I wonder why they use the term rebuke and if there's anything within that. But, I mean, it's just a matter of these guys, at least some of them were fishermen. So this was not new or that it had to have been something even worse than normal. Yeah. Well, it did say the boat started filling up with water. Yeah. And I think we've we've ratted on these guys a lot about this. Like, shouldn't they have known? But... When the boat starts filling up with water, you start to get a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, It's a violent windstorm. You know, this, yeah. is, this is bad times. Yeah, and so when Jesus gets up and he rebukes the waves and the and the wind, at what point, you know, when Jesus says, where is your faith, what was the faith supposed to be? Was their faith supposed to have been that they should have been able to rebuke the wind and the waves? Mm, or maybe. should they have had faith that, hey, this is just going to all work out and maybe Jesus like will wake up when he gets wet? Eventually the water's going to get down the hill and he's going to wake <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah. He's going to get wet, he'll wake up, and he'll take care of it. <laughs> and maybe they should have known, like, this is not our time yet. <laughs> yeah. Maybe but they, how would they have known? Is the walking know. on the water later in Luke? Because maybe they should have walked on the water or they saw that and they should have been like, yeah, we can take care of this. We'll just yeah. float. Well, and it's, uh, man, it's, it's just, <clears throat> it's going to be circular because this is our nature. We are weak in the flesh. And mm-hmm. whenever, you know, the storms hit us hard like that, our, our go-to is going to be fear. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's not what we want. It's not who we want to be. And, and we can tell ourselves in the daylight all the time, hey, you know, you're going to walk in faith and, and be good. And this is going to, you're going to trust God. And then the moment that, Whatever it is that particular storm hits, it, it changes changes things. And it uh, was it the seal say there's no plan survives contact. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know you can go in with a plan, but you know once you contact the enemy, yeah, it normally the, the plan falls apart, and you just you know we got to figure it out from there. Yeah, they but, say it other ways, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you know the idea is that is the the frailty of our flesh, and mm-hmm. obviously we want to fight against that. We don't want to make excuses for it. That's not the reality here, but. That still is what we're seeing, and uh, not only what we're seeing in them, what we see in ourselves. So my takeaway whenever I read this story, and here's what I love most about it for me, because I know I'm weak just like this, that uh, it did not prevent Jesus from calming the winds and uh, rebuking the the storm. Even though their faith was weak, Jesus was still faithful. And uh, and so that's my consistent go-to in stories like this, and there's a bunch of them Mm -hmm. where, you know, the, the... the faith of the individual did not measure up, but God's faithfulness always does. You know, even though I can't have confidence that I'm going to be, you know, that rock ribbed faith, you know, bashing the faith in the moments, I can have confidence that God is going to still be God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Within the healing of the demoniac, um, we've, again, this is still familiar territory for us. But one of the things that I want to mention is 
point out, at least at first, is I'm still impressed with the fact that these demons cannot help but engage Jesus. It's not like, you know, you would think that in some ways maybe their strategy would be like, hey, let's just be quiet. <laughs> let's, let's just kind of keep it on the down low. Let's just kind of hide. Quick, quick, put some clothes on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They can't help but engage Jesus. And uh, we've mentioned this before, but the fact that they're even asking Jesus, hey, you know, they're questioning him on the timing, but they're also seeing and, and understanding that he has the ability to torment them. They request, hey, let's send us into the pigs instead of sending us into the abyss. And, and Jesus does that for whatever reason. And I think that the only reason that I've come to conclusion on, <laughs> it's more a matter of timing. Like this is the theme that I've kind of been seeing within these set of chapters. The timing is so important on things that it wasn't Jesus' time or it wasn't the right time. And even in this, it's not the time yet. It is all about the plan of Christ in terms of the Messiah and what God is doing. And so it's all, it kind of comes back to the timing. I mean, this is another one of those times where this guy didn't even ask for healing. Like, Jesus just cast these demons out. I mean, it was more an interaction between Jesus and the demons than Jesus and this man until afterwards. Mm. Where yeah. it, when Jesus has healed people, they want to follow him. And we even saw it with these women that, you know, Mary Magdalene had demons in her. And after and she was others, healed, yeah. yep, she was she was permitted to come and follow Jesus. But this guy, his job is different. And, you know, we talked about this every time, but, you know, I think about it as the people in the town didn't want to hear or didn't want Jesus there. <laughs> yeah. Now this guy has a responsibility to, to share the good news. I kind of, you know, just look at it as his great commission almost in that moment. Yeah. And what, what a testimony. I yeah. mean, this is like Jonah showing up after being in a well, right? <laughs> Right. It's like, hey, you remember me? <laughs> yeah, I remember you. you. I, I remember all of you. <laughs> yeah. You look different with clothes on. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and just the fact that these people were afraid, like, that yeah. makes me question, too. Like, so I understand or we get, like, the fact that, and we talked about this before, when they, when they saw the pigs, you know, they're all coming out. Hey, is this true? You know, somebody just came in and told us that these kid, pigs just, they just went off the cliff and they, you know, they drowned. And so there's that financial aspect, and we tend to focus on that, that maybe that's part of the reason why they wanted Jesus to leave. But there's also this aspect, as Luke puts it, that they were afraid. They didn't yeah. know what to do with this guy. Right. Not perhaps even the, the guy that was demon-possessed, but also especially Jesus. Mm. And so they were, you know, kind of chasing him out of town. Yeah. And it's and so interesting to be able to fully see, you know, the purpose of why Jesus is there. Jesus had to leave, which is interesting. But Yeah. yeah. Well, so there's something beautiful in that, too, though. I mean, he came... Because it's not like he didn't know, right? Right. He yeah. came for one person. Yep. I love and that. then left. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, and, but, you know, turn that guy in the right direction, set the mm -hmm. world on fire, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, then let's move on into chapter nine. Um, so Jesus is sending out the 12. So he's called them, and now he's sending them out. He's giving them power and authority. The fact that they have utter dependence on God because they are told to take nothing. Like, mm -hmm. this is not anything, <laughs> any source of comfort, any source of sustenance, any source of, you know, even extra clothes. And so right. they're completely yeah. dependent upon God. And so one of the things that I think about within this is, you know, what, is, what does this mean for our life? What does this look like? Because obviously we have a lot of comforts. And I've often said the mission field, one of the things that's appealing about the mission field in my mind, even just for me personally, is because when you wake up every day and you're like, okay, I can look and list off all these things that I've given up for God. Hmm. Whereas here... I'm like, you know, after the day's done or whatever, and I'm, you know, watching TV or something like that, or you're scrolling on your phone, I'm like, okay, this life, you know, if I worked a nine to five somewhere else, then, you know, how different is it? You know, what am I pointing to to say, what have I given up? And obviously I could name some things, but at the same time, it's like, I still have hot showers. Yeah. Yep. I still have a yep. closet full of clothes. <laughs> yeah. I still have cars that I can drive and go wherever I want, whenever I want type idea. Right. Um, and so I look at this and I'm like, you know, what does this look like in our life? So what do you guys think? Michael's headed to the monastery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I think that's uh, beyond what they were given up. It's, I think it's a step into the unknown is kind of the idea here. And, and for all of us who stepped out into ministry, that was the step into the unknown. Because you don't know when you're 21 in college that, you know, this is going to be how well you're going to be taken care of. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was my fear. I feared that I would not be so well taken care of in, in ministry, you know, financially or creature comfort or whatever it might be. And uh, so it was coming to the place where I was willing to surrender that desire um, 
even though it's not worked out to be that reality. And like you said, I hot showers, you know, car lot full of suburban. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it this time. <laughs> it, uh, you know, and it's, we, I, I lack for nothing, absolutely nothing in, in this life. And so, but, but there was a step there, at least in a moment where it was perception of reality, but there was a perception of, okay, am I willing to, to live this life if it does mean that I'm not going to have these creature comforts that I so desire in life. We all desire that, whether we tell ourselves we do or not, we do. Mm. And uh, and so I think it's coming to the point where you're willing to say, yeah, I will surrender that if that's what God wants. And uh, and here's what I find. it's uh, That's when you open your hand, right? And say, okay, I'm going to let go. And then God ends up putting more in your hand than you had before. What you were hanging on to was less than what God gives you, not just in the way of creature comforts, so much more than that, obviously, just a life that is more fulfilling, uh, more enjoyable. And uh, but also in regards to just the the stuff of life that, you know, is temporary yeah. and, and somewhat meaningless. God also <laughs> could, gives that in rich abundance as well. Just I think as just another way of saying, hey, look, I've got everything. And so the more we can trust him and I tell people this all the time, God can take better care of you than you can take care of yourself. And the, the reality is, is keep coming to the place where you're willing to surrender to his care over your care. And, uh, and then mm-hmm. you get to experience some richness that you couldn't experience otherwise. Yeah, and I think that it goes hand in hand. Um, I was trying to look to see, glance forward to see if uh, we're hitting it this time. But yeah, just the whole idea of seek first the kingdom of heaven. Um, and then, you know, all these things will be added to you type idea. That even if we do go without X, Y, and Z, right. then it'll still be better. Like we're still more yeah. satisfied than we were in the first place. Yeah. And so the satisfaction that would come from other things, hearing people confess Christ and coming to Christ and hearing of ministry being done and all that type of stuff is way better than, you know, a hot shower when it really comes down to it. Well, and let's just be honest, in in the context of of the three of us here at at Oak Grove Baptist, there's a lot of people that make a lot more money than us who I wouldn't trade jobs with. That's true. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I love my job. Yeah, And uh, and then if any of y'all leave, I'm going to kneecap you instead of saying that. (laughs) And then let's see, you know, for the, the audience watching, too, the doing this work together in ministry with these guys really is fun. It's, yeah. uh, it's exciting and it's, uh, it's unique. It's every day. It's not like, you know, when I've thought about, you know, being on assembly line or some type of work where it's just monotonous. Like, I I do not love monotony. And if you know anything yeah. about my personality, that's not me. <laughs> I'm going to change it up. If for nothing else, just change it. God knows you better than you know yourself, right? Yeah. Well, and I was just about to say, I don't know that I would have known myself. I can see it from yeah. this side of it. Sure. Yeah. But I'm so glad that I didn't have to see it and realize it from the other side right. of it. You but, know, yeah. the, but God so, knew about you. Yeah. Yeah. And same for me. I would not, this is not the, the line of work I would have chosen. In fact, I said no for a whole year to God and, uh, and yet God pursued me and he knew me better than I knew myself. And I can't imagine doing anything else. Mm. I couldn't even tell you the amount of people that said, do not go into ministry. And their follow up to that was, you're not going to be able to make a living on that. Oh yeah. yeah. And man, I just, especially like, for music. I, mean, I know yeah. like, wow, it's like the lowest starving <laughs> artist. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you know anything about artists, they don't make any money either. So yeah. if, don't go into music as a career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things that I do appreciate about you, Josh, too, is uh, I saw a reel that this pastor was talking about the quickest way to get a mic in a church today is just by having talent, like being an influencer, essentially. And so usually what he, his context was be a worship leader. Um, because, you know, if you have talent and you can play and, you know, you gain a following and you've got so many influ- so much influence, then, yeah, people are going to give you a platform and they're going to mm-hmm. hand you a mic and you're going to be able to say. And so now we're stuck with all these people that have not been trained, that have not been, you know, gone through, you know, scripture, basically. You know, they, they have an ability and they have thoughts and they have perhaps experiences to go by, but they're not solid within doctor and they're not, you know, and he mentioned like, you know, they don't, they know nothing about eschatology. They know nothing about ecclesiology. They know no, nothing about this, that, and the other. They don't know what a read is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just saying, I, I've, I've told Josh this many times before, but I do appreciate him primarily, um, not only just for his musical ability, but the fact that it also comes with, uh, his, his love for the word of God and the mm-hmm. reason why you're sitting here today too. <laughs> I yeah. mean, the fact that in this room, oh, in yeah. this context, you know, yeah. so and a lot of people probably don't get to see it, but you you are a student. Yeah, I watch it. It's, uh, he, he likes to go deep on some stuff. I'm like, oh man, how's he got, how's he got more time than me? <laughs> uh, you guys are always in meetings. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna start giving him some of my work. Say, hey, figure this out for me, because I want to know what God's saying here. <laughs> so within the feeding of the five thousand, I do want to just kind of figure 
this is why we pray before meals because nah. <laughs> inflation got us <laughs> feeling like we're feeding 5,000 people. <laughs> Like, how are we going to afford this? Or we may be in the same boat. Took four people out to lunch, and I hate to admit this. Two of us shared a plate, and it cost me $70 yeah. yesterday. Within the 23, with the call to discipleship as it's listed, one of the things that I commonly think or remind myself of is that following in Jesus' footsteps is really meaning you know, following in his suffering. And so when we when we talk and we baptize people, you know, that we're buried with Christ, raised in, new, in newness of life, part of that buried in Christ is actually acknowledging and identifying with the suffering of Jesus that led to the death. And so, yes, it's the death of the old self. It's the death that we had in sin and all that. But I think maybe perhaps some of the symbolism needs to extend into the fact that we've got suffering as well that we may be called to, not just mm-hmm. beyond out of creature comforts, but also into <laughs> the suffering and, and what that means. Maybe I want to talk about thoughts. this fire falling down from heaven, um, you know, on this village in Samaria, <laughs> because so Jesus was going to go through to go to Jerusalem, but they rejected him. And, yeah. you know, this is 51. <laughs> James and John said, Hey Lord, we can, we can call down fire from heaven and consume them. Um, but this obviously is where they Jesus got the sons was, of thunder thing. Yeah. Right. And Jesus was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> rebuked him right there. I think it's interesting that they've seen Jesus' compassion mm. demonstrated so many times, yet this was their response. And they're like, we're going to, you know, we want judgment upon this city for for rejecting you to go through. And it shows the hatred that had to have been there from the Samaritans to the Jews, the Jews to mm-hmm. the Samaritans. And, uh, you know, it's also not that long (laughs) later that we have Jesus telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, let's remember that. Also, you know, for application, it points to our natural proclivity to use Jesus to fight our battles. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a particular bent on this, that or the other. And we try to weaponize Jesus sometimes. Yeah. In in that, you know, regard. And so it's uh, it's a thing that's in all of us. We have to be careful about that. Hey, look. His marching yeah. order is compassion. It's that, yeah. uh, he's not to be weaponized against right. people. <laughs> I I want to look at verse 51 still. The days were drawing near for him to be taken up. And so we see that as Luke is mentioning the ascension, he's alluding to the ascension, not just even to Jesus' death and resurrection, mm-hmm. but for him to be taken up. And it says, Jesus set out resolutely to go to Jerusalem. There's a couple of things that I want to kind of highlight in there. One is just the fact that I think one of the reasons, or I guess they kind of pair together, I think the reason why Jesus was able to set out resolutely, like set his face towards Jerusalem and knowing everything that was going to be coming in Jerusalem was because he had his eyes and knowing what was going to come Mm. after that. Mm -hmm. And so there's application for us too, knowing that when we set our minds on things above, not on the things that are here on earth, then then it allows us to to let go or to be open-handed as Pastor talked about before. But that idea that, you know, he's able to set his resolution uh, the res- resolve in his, his spirit to be able to go to Jerusalem and experience all of that because of what was going to be coming from the end of it, that God was going to get glory. That And of course, Jesus, he should have, I think that he would have known at least that he was going to be glorified in it as well. Mm-hmm. But I think that's huge. It's a big marker that, <laughs> and again, I think, I think really when it comes down to it, I think Jesus was supernaturally upheld in all of that. Moving on into the cost of following Jesus, as, as you mentioned, what what is what is all the meaning within all of this? So when Jesus says that foxes have dens and the birds have nests, we know we understand that you know he's kind of talking about he's he's homeless in a sense. At least Jesus is home, homeless in, a, in in one way or another. But also that you know when he responds, let the dead bury their own dead, and and if you put your hands to the plow, don't you know don't turn back. Basically, right. Uh, what is what is the bigger meaning behind all of this? What is Jesus actually trying to get across? That following him is a focus past the temporary. It's, mm-hmm. um, there, there's, it's a perception of something so much greater, the reality of the kingdom of God, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's, uh, once you you have that perception, it's almost like taking the, the other pill it's from the matrix. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it kind of wakes you up <laughs> and you realize, okay, all this other stuff is just other stuff. And so if your focus is still on that, then something is, is a little bit askew, right? And, and so Jesus is bringing us back to reality that, that once you start this journey, then you're going to see things from a different perspective. And uh, the things that, that held such ties on you aren't going to be the things that, that should at least hold those same ties on you moving forward. 
for sure. And I think that, you know, when it comes to all of this, uh, it's a matter of, is Jesus worth it? You know, is he worth mm-hmm. more? Like if, at the very least, if it boils down to you being homeless, giving up hot showers, whatever, is Jesus worth it? Is it worth, you know, that you would miss even something as big as bearing your own father? Is it worth making sure that whatever you're leaving behind, <laughs> that you're not turning back and thinking, oh, well, maybe maybe that would have been better. But we set our mind, I guess perhaps similarly to the way that Jesus set his mind that way, that we resolve to follow mm-hmm. Jesus and that mm-hmm. Jesus is worth it, yep. that all of this is worth it. So whatever suffering comes, even if it means death, that we set it, set our minds to it to say, yes, he is worth it. Yeah, and I, you know, I'll add even as as we move into chapter 10, he appoints 72 people to go out and do the same thing, kind of like the disciples. But what he, you know, when they're going and doing these things and they report back to him, he says in verse 20 of chapter 10, nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names stand written mm-hmm. in heaven. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, yeah, if you're following Jesus and you're, you know, setting your minds on things above and you get to do all these great things, those are great. But don't forget that the greatest is that your name stand written in heaven. Yeah. What I had written down was don't celebrate in the work, but in the belonging. Mm -hmm. And so that idea Mm -hmm. of be defined more by being than by doing. Mm -hmm. It's not that the doing is not important, but that our primary definition of who we are and our identity is, is who we are in Christ. And so it's not, what am I doing? How many people have I brought in? What type of works have I done? But that, you know, are the spirits obeying me even? (laughs) But I'm, you know, my name is written in the book yep. of life. Well, I think that trickles down to our day to day and the fact that we get up and our number one is we got to accomplish tasks mm-hmm. as opposed to we've got to spend time in the presence, right? Well, let's go to verse 21. It says, on the same occasion, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to little children. Does that strike you a little bit odd in terms of Jesus rejoicing that something that should be revealed is actually being hidden from certain people. I mean, so, you know, God's ways are not our ways, right? I yeah. mean, I also think it's odd that uh, he shows grace to demons. You know, <laughs> yeah. I got big issues with this. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, no, don't send them to the pigs, send them to the outer darkness, whatever it is that they don't want, do that. Yeah. And, uh, and he doesn't, he acquiesces and, you know, so I like, hey, you know, it's above my pay grade. <laughs> I don't understand it all, but uh, we also, it's not surprising because he's been telling us all along that there's going to be a blindness to some degree. And yeah, and um, and these things are not discerned through, you know, intellect, it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's not surprising. We could, I guess, have issues with it, but (laughs) to, to know... To no avail. Well, and and so this is what it boils down to. It says, yes, right after that, yes, Father, this was your gracious will. And so it's not just the will of God. It's actually or forced or anything like that, but it's actually shown as being gracious. And so it's one of those things where I've, I've heard a lot of people that have kind of walked away from the faith. So they've been in it, but then they've deconstructed or whatever word that you want to use. And so many times they look at it and they, you can't get away from the fact that they are kind of putting themselves over and above God. So now they are starting to put, be in a position where they are judging God. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's with the word of God. Sometimes it's just God himself. And they're like, I could come up with a more like, look, I just came up with a more moral solution than God. You know, this all powerful mm-hmm. God of the universe did. Right. And so I think a lot of that too, with the wise and the intelligent, uh, it's a matter of we're refusing to submit. Yeah. So in chapter 11, one of the things that I thought was kind of funny was that, you know, we're 11 chapters into Luke and these guys are just now asking Jesus how to pray. Um, yeah. <laughs> they had already been with Jesus. Like they, we found earlier that they were with Jesus while he was praying. Jesus was off a little bit in the distance, but it's, it's taken them this long to say, hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Mm. I want to know what John's prayer was that he taught. Like, is it the mm. same? Is it similar? We won't know, but I'd like to know. Mm. <laughs> I, yeah, I'd like to sit down and yeah. compare them. Yeah, when you find out, tell me. Yeah, I mean, I never will. No, well, I mean, maybe one <laughs> day, but you, you won't care then, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pastor, you hit on the persistence, mm. <laughs> and I think you did a good job just in the sense that I was right there with you, <laughs> you know, as far as like, oh my goodness, if we have something that is persistent and kind of right there in your noise, like right now I'm hearing a fan. And I'm like, what in the world is that? <laughs> There's nothing to teach it to you better than a persistent child. Yes. Mm. I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's funny is when you were talking about it on Sunday, then uh, my mind went directly to some of my kids. 
and some of the recent instances, because I'm pretty sure the words that came out of my mouth were, yes, fine. Just, just leave me alone. Basically. <laughs> like, I don't care. You can have because, everything. <laughs> yeah. And I'm pretty sure it was related to candy. <laughs> And, you know, I'm working like I've got earbuds in and I'm working. I'm, I'm like trying to do some stuff and then I can see them. They're right there in my vision. I can't hear them. But then so I'm like, I finally like, OK, what can I have some candy? And, you know, I'm just like, I'm working. Don't bother me type thing. And it's consistent, consistent, consistent. And I'm like, Fern, so yeah, yeah, just just eat whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> well, and the, the beauty of that whole story is that we acquiesce, even though we're in frustration, even though it's uh, we don't want to be you know bothered. Yet God is none of those things. He's not yeah. frustrated. He's not overwhelmed. He is fully 100 percent appreciative of the fact that we keep coming. And so how much more uh, do we have his ear in those instances? And so uh, I find a lot of comfort and uh, and education in this passage. Yeah, for sure. And for me as a dad, I think I need to take a hint from my Heavenly Father on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm there with you too. I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Well, Ryan's pretty sort annoying of. sometimes, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's got some persistence. You'll see it. Yeah. <laughs> what, are, what are you guys seeing from the rest of chapter 11, I guess? Well, so for, you know, verses 14 through 23, again, the... We've seen that in the previous Gospels, and apparently that was that happened when he was around Nazareth in his hometown. That was one of the accusations, you get, basing it on the chronology of the other Gospels, at least. Mm-hmm. But uh, so you know, this could have been his his people throwing that dig at him. But uh, you know, he he overcomes it easily. Verse twenty two is like, look, it don't make no sense. You guys will be, you know, this is it's not logical. <laughs> he tells them that a lot. Basically, your whole thing is your whole premise is not logical. And so I love the fact that that Jesus is logical, yeah. that the gospel is logical, that the word of God is logical. It, uh, and you, you can't win anybody on logic. I get that to, to some degree. But at least we have a mountain of logical evidence to stand on for our step of faith. And so the fact that he keeps coming back to, hey, guys, that don't make no sense. <laughs> let's, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's think a little deeper now. And, uh, I just like, he's like, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, then who do your sons cast them out by? Yeah, right. yeah. He's always got these questions. You leave them scratching their head a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, well, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a corner. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> what about the waterless places? And Man, the I don't know about that one. I was hoping you wouldn't mention that. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. Do, do demons have a problem with water? Uh. Uh, I would like to say, mention that cats do too. <laughs> <laughs> we do give cat lovers a hard time don't don't take it personal we love you guys <laughs> so verse 27 and 28 i thought was kind of interesting because it reminds me of when jesus's family was around and he was like my true family is actually those who hear the word of god and do it and so this lady in the crowd spoke up and was like basically blessed is your mom mm-hmm. and he's like well blessed rather are those who hear the word of god and obey it so I don't know. What's the deal with like all these people trying to worship his family? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, boy, I mean, was, I get it. She was doing it before it was popular. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Col- I mean, breaking cultural norms, I'm sure. Um, and trying to drive home a point. But yeah, I just think it's interesting that people keep bringing it up. Mm. The fact that the response is obedience. Um, yeah. Blessed are those who hear and obey. One of the things, because this is in relation to the unclean spirit and coming back into a person I actually wonder if this is part of the protection against demonic influence. Mm. I mean, it makes sense, obviously. We would probably come to the conclusion even without this, but, you know, to hear it and see it, you know, from the Word of God, you know, that when we hear the Word of God and we obey it, that Mm. is perhaps protection against every sort of demonic activity, not just influence or in terms of deception, perhaps, but actually other demonic activity as well. I like that uh, verse 29 and following how he references back to the the queen that, you know, mm-hmm. came went, and saw it. Yeah, went so far to, to see something, you know, as great as Solomon. And, you know, mm-hmm. now there's greater now. Went from the ends of the earth, which, you know, I'm going to park the bus for just a second right there because some people are using comments like that to say the earth is square <laughs> or flat or whatever it is. It's like, hey, wait a minute. That's not what it means. You know, it's, it's some, some unique stuff out there. But, uh, uh, you know, the the fact that, you know, she sought so hard to see something and yet there's something right here in front of them and uh, and they refuse to see it is going to be part of their judgment. Yeah. Starting in verse 33, it's uh, talking about the place in a lamp. You know, I don't, don't put it under bad. Well, sing that mm-hmm. song growing up, you know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hide it under a bushel. No, I'm yep. going to let it shine. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but verse 34 has always been a unique um, statement for me as far as your the, your eye is the lamp of your body, and if the mm-hmm. eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, and if it's not healthy, then you're full of darkness. And so what did y'all discover when you you know did your deep dive on that one? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel like I needed to do a deep dive. All right. <laughs> I just took it as like, okay, if you can see, then you understand, and if you can't see, then you don't understand. I'm and a, you're in the darkness. That's pretty good. I mean, for a guy to look up a read, I think that's right. Really yeah, good. I mean, I have to look up some things, but not everything. Sometimes the spirit discerns. Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm it just wasn't it. discerning a read, <laughs> like a clarinet. Like they didn't have those back then. Well, so, but there's also a key in 35. It says, "Therefore, see to it that the light." in you is not darkness right. and we would see that mm. and be like well of course the light in you is not going to be darkness they're complete opposites you can't have one like they can't be existing together um light drives out darkness and so i think that there's point in that i think it does go back to what are we allowing in mm-hmm. and so what comes to our eyes is not just you know the typical things that we go to but I mean, it can be even things that are, you know, we can go to just materialism in general. Mm. Um, you know, what am I seeing that I'm coveting? What am I seeing that is causing lust? What am I seeing that is, you know, X, Y, and Z fill in the blank. What is it that's coming in that is being dark? I, I often go to even students where when I feel like when students, and so this goes to, you know, adults too, but when you have an unhealthy infatuation with something that is of darkness, so to speak, and it doesn't even have to be on the demonic side, but it can be just dark, that things that we would just be considering dark in general. So it could be your sense of humor. Um, and I'm not talking just a dark sense of humor, mm-hmm. but I'm talking about like the crude joking. Like, right. like we see that in the rest of New Testament as well. We shouldn't be ones that are around crude joking and, and constantly with that. But the people that are always like, you know, it's a thing now either horror movies or serial killer type dramas or whatever. I'm like, there, it feels like that shouldn't, it just doesn't sit well. Let me put it that way. And so it's like, I think that's part of it. What is, what is in us? And because Mm -hmm. we also see when what comes out of us is coming from the overflow of our heart. And so that's going to come out not only in our speech and we see that all the time, but I think it also comes out in actions. Well, and I think it is still, um, to, to your point, verse 35 tells us we, we've got to be consistent in making sure that the things that we are letting in are the things that are associated with light. Yeah. yeah. And that, um, you know, so that's just our resistance to darkness is letting light in. So the word of God, the, the spirit of God, you know. So, I mean, if you guys are into <laughs> some things that maybe are along the lines of darkness, then make sure the light is... <laughs> Going way beyond. <laughs> it's like you got to overcompensate times. with yeah, that light. Like, increase your intake. <laughs> it's like vitamin C, right? We'll see you in church on Sunday. You got to yeah. up. Okay, so I feel like this is interesting, mainly because the the woes in Matthew are kind of you, you get the idea that it's in in Jerusalem at the temple, um, but this is at a dinner. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This very, is a dinner party. <laughs> very personal, isn't it? Yeah. This is not and a crowd so, of a thousand. <laughs> it's like, hey, you. And so he didn't wash his hands, and they're all like, whoa. And he's, <laughs> he loads up. <laughs> 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 yeah. But, I mean, it, it really, so for me, the reminder is, you know, don't get caught up on, caught up on the superficial things. What is important is, one, being authentic. This is a big woe that Jesus has for these guys is the authenticity of their faith. And then two, if you look in verse 45, you know, the experts in the religious law, they're, they're like, Hey, this is, insults us too. And he's saying, well, you add things to the law to burden people down. And so you don't want to be a burden to people. (laughs) So, I mean, essentially it all comes back to, um, being compassionate. And so those are the kinds of things that I take away from, from this little encounter here, be yeah. authentic and be compassionate and love the Lord, your God. I mean, we can just, we'll sum it all up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Put a bow on this bad boy. Yeah. yeah. With all your heart, soul, mind, strength. That's it. Neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. 53, when they came out from there, the experts in the law and the Pharisees began to oppose him bitterly and ask him hostile questions about many things, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. And this is not anything obviously new. This is, what they've been doing all along is just becoming more obvious now that uh, that they have no desire to accept. It's, it's they've they're 
quickly turning a corner. And obviously from this entire interaction, they're upset, they're insulted. And since they are their God, Jesus has now insulted their God. And so there's no place for him at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we just kind of see this whole thing taking the turn. We knew it was going to take eventually because we've read it in Matthew and Mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it is just taking that turn and it's going to lead to the conclusion that they think is the solution, which is their end. Um, basically, they're going to be held accountable for all the, the blood of the prophets because of how they're dealing with Jesus. And so that's kind of the idea we're getting to there toward the end of chapter 11 is their they're dealing with him that's really going to be their defining moment in a bad way. Yeah. But uh, sets up the defining moment for the rest of us in a good way. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So we're going to have to end this one on on slightly of a downer. But <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> the, good, the good news is coming. You know, yeah. Right? Just as the sun dips below the horizon, give us a don't, minute. It's going to come back up. Don't be a Pharisee. <laughs>